Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. Today we're looking at what colleges and universities are doing about misconduct issues that have been an increasing problem. They include incidents of sexual abuse, discrimination, bullying, and more. What's the response? Moon Choi, the president of the University of Missouri System, issued a recent statement undersigned by leaders of system campuses, reaffirming a strong commitment to institutional accountability, transparency, and the protection of students, employees, and visitors. So where do we stand and where are we going? Joining me in studio to discuss it are Dana Petit Daniels, Title IX Coordinator and Chief Equity Officer for the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Nicole Gorofsky is a local attorney who advocates for victims of abuse. And with us by phone, Sarah Brown, Senior Reporter with the Chronicle of Higher Education in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, all of you, for being with us. Great to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Sarah, I'll begin with you. Can you give me kind of a a Cliff Notes overview of what's going on on our campuses with regard to these uh, abuse issues? Sure. So what we're talking about here, um, although I I will note that the the, uh, University of Missouri's letter was sort of speaking broadly about, um, you know, discrimination, workplace misconduct, a lot of what uh, the the letter is referring to is, is sexual abuse, sexual assault, sexual harassment, and that concerns uh, Title IX. So Title IX is the, you know, 1972 federal law that um, prevents um, discrimination in educational programs on the basis of sex. And so, you know, if students are being sexually harassed or assaulted, that affects their educational experience. Um, And I, you know, there are a couple of things going on um, in the world right now that are really at the forefront of uh, university officials across the country, including in Missouri, so one, one thing is Michigan State University. Um, obviously, they've had a huge sexual abuse scandal with Larry Nasser, a former sports doctor who abused hundreds of victims under the guise of giving them medical treatment. That's one piece of this. There's also the Me Too movement, which has not spared higher ed. There are an increasing number of people coming forward about, for example, star professors who have harassed them in some way. So I, I would say it's, it's, it's certainly fair to say that colleges are kind of on edge right now with respect to these issues. This, uh, these issues are really affecting just about all of them in one way or another, aren't they? Yes, and you'll often see uh, universities sort of address um, either a, you know, a sexual assault scandal going on on their campus or a response to a case of, you know, allegations of sexual harassment, they will say, look, we are not alone in this. This is affecting every institution across the country. Um, and, uh, you know, what I read in the uh, Missouri letter uh, is that University of Missouri officials are trying to be proactive here, trying not to be caught off guard by something like this happening, because they all acknowledge that look, this affects every campus across the country. Dana Daniels, let me turn to you. How is the University of Missouri-St. Louis reacting to uh, Mr. Choi's comments? Well, as we have done, uh, we want to make sure that we have programs implemented to encourage reporting by faculty, staff, and students throughout the campus. Uh, We're promoting more of a learning environment to ensure that our students or everyone, any visitor to the campus, is aware of who to go to, um, who to speak with, with regard to any impropriety regarding sexual harassment, sexual assault on our campus. As uh, Sarah has indicated, Title IX is the is the principal tool, I guess, in this. But many people, I suspect, think of Title IX only in terms of women in sports on, in colleges. How does this tool work? Well... I believe initially uh, when it when it started in 1972, it was probably instituted with the guise of promoting more women in athletics. Um, it has risen over the years, not only for women, but for men, our LGBTQ plus community as well, because they are being taken advantage of as well with regard to the 
sexual harassment. And it's also gender discrimination. It's not limited to sexual assault or sexual harassment. It also includes any type of discrimination against any one class because of their gender. Nicole Gorovsky, is this, in your mind, an effective tool? Title IX is a very complicated tool, is what I would say. Um, In the court system, Title IX has a lot of complicated issues, but what we're talking about here is in the university system. And so the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights has tried to give some guidance to colleges and universities on how to implement Title IX with regard to uh, assessing these sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, campus violence issues. And so that's become a really big political issue in the last few years, which I think probably many people have heard in the news. So to give like a just a very brief history of that, um, in the Obama era, there were uh, there was some guidance from the Department of Education in uh, 2000. And, sorry, even before the Obama era in 2001, there was guidance, um, but then it, if, saying that there's a duty to eliminate the harassing conduct, and there are a number of compliance requirements for these universities with regard to Title IX, meaning that they each university has to have a program for dealing with these sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, and sexual violence issues that come up on campus. Then the Obama-era guidance came forward and said, we're going to put forth a preponderance of the evidence standard, which basically means there's a 51% standard in judging these cases. So when someone comes forward and says, hey, I was abused, then it goes before the university for a disciplinary proceeding, and there's a 51% standard, meaning it's more likely than not that this happened. Now what's happened recently is that uh, Trump-era Betsy DeVos has come forward and said, no, we're taking back those Obama-era standards and saying that's not the correct standard. The proponents of the evidence standard is not the correct standard, that that's not enough due process for the accused. And um, so they've, they've given a higher standard of review. So basically, that's the basic political climate, and it's made it very complicated for universities to know exactly what to do here. Sarah, how do you read that change uh, between the uh, guidelines established by President Obama and now uh, the Trump administration? Right. So that is very, that is correct that DeVos did withdraw two key pieces of Obama-era guidance that had really set the agenda um, across higher education with respect to how they handle uh, issues of sexual assault and harassment for the past you know, five or six years. Um, I, you know, there's certainly a, a more of an emphasis both at, in the, at the federal government level and just across um, higher ed on fairness and due process and ensuring that both uh, victims and accused students are both given sort of the same treatment. Um, I will say that from what I've seen across college campuses across the country, not a lot has changed in the past year or so since those Obama-era guidelines were withdrawn. So on campuses, like on the ground, things are pretty much the same in terms of policies, the way that complaints are handled. Not a lot has really changed on that front. Um, And I will also say that, you know, part of the reason the Obama-era Office for Civil Rights took action is because of the activism of students who were telling their stories of being assaulted and said the colleges didn't take them seriously. Those, those, that activism has not died down. Um, in fact, it's it's really continued to uh, occupy a pretty prominent space in sort of national discourse with the Me Too movement. So I would say that obviously there's been a big shift at the federal level, but if you're thinking about sort of how this plays out on the ground on the average college or university campus, I think uh, a lot of it has remained the same. Let me get your take on that, Dana. I would, I do agree with what she's saying. I think the reason for Bessie DeVos's removal is that she had concern regarding policies that were in place that weren't fair across the board for the institutions. For example, with regard to the more likely than not preponderance of evidence, um, it's okay 
to utilize that as long as we're utilizing that same process with regard to student conduct or any other type of hearing that we may happen to have on our particular campus. We have not had any changes on our campus because we have treated all hearing panels um, with the preponderance of evidence uh, standard in all processes. I think from what I have read and what I have seen that there were some campuses who were in who were using the preponderance of evidence in in this case, but maybe in student conduct it it wasn't utilized. So I would say um I think locally there has been some confusion. I think uh, some of the cases that have been my experience is that universities in the past year don't know exactly what standard to apply. Um, The preponderance of the evidence standard, um, I'm just going to share my personal opinion here, there's nothing wrong with that standard. That's the standard that the civil courts use uh, to determine these cases when they play out in court. So uh, there's nothing wrong with that standard. But at the same time, when then the new guidance came out and said, no, we're going to say a higher standard, some of the cases that I have seen going through the system, um, the university isn't even saying what standard they're applying because I think they don't know what standard to apply. And so they're making determinations, but then being very vague with their students about how they made those determinations. I think it would have an impact on people coming forward as well. If they don't understand what the rules are, uh, they might be reluctant to come forward. That's right. That's right. Well, uh, do you have anything you want to add to that, Sarah? Sure. I mean, this is an evolving space, clearly. You know, one thing I will um, add is is uh, the, the DeVos guidelines that were issued last September, they don't necessarily say that you cannot use the preponderance, the more likely than not standard. They say you can use preponderance or a slightly higher standard, clear and convincing. They kind of leave it open to universities to choose which one they feel is best. Um, and uh, so, again, it's, it's a sort of evolving space where and, and what we could see um, over the next couple of years, depending on what else comes out of the federal government, uh, there are supposed to be Title IX regulations that are going to be issued this fall that would cover um, sexual assault, abuse, harassment in higher ed. Depending on how those shake out, I think we could start seeing you know, colleges doing things differently depending on where they are and how they feel about you know, standards of evidence and how these complaints should be handled. So it's possible that, you know, a university in Missouri might choose to apply one standard and a university across the border in Illinois could apply a different standard. Um, That's something sort of a patchwork of policies that we could see evolving in the next couple of years. I have to take a break, but very quickly, Nicole, I want to turn to you because I'm not quite sure I understand how you determine this preponderance. We were talking earlier about 51 percent. How do you determine 51 percent or 55 percent or 60 percent? How is that determined? Sure. So the university is supposed to do a thorough investigation and is supposed to talk to all witnesses involved and is supposed to gather all of the evidence and then weigh that evidence on both sides and then judge that 51 percent. Now, I'm going to say, and I have some empathy for these universities, that this is a very difficult task for universities. They're not trained to do this. Um, They don't necessarily have um, the experience to do this. But that said, they've had a lot of time to implement these policies and procedures. And so universities at this point should be getting the training and guidance that they need in order to do this. And their Title IX investigators and coordinators should know exactly how to do a complete investigation at this point in time and weigh that evidence. Dana, you agree with that? I agree. And uh, we make sure that our investigators are trained um, annually, attend the workshops, attend the training, uh, so that we're operating under best practices. I still don't know how you get to the 51 percent, how that's <laughs> determined. In other words, how do you weigh that? How do you judge that? Is it having 51 uh, percent of the people investigating or judging the issue, agreeing with the one side or the other? Well, I think that's – your question leads to part of the problem, I think. Yeah. So uh, some of the universities aren't telling us exactly how they're doing that, okay. and that's part of the problem. 
Um, but also, I think um, when they're getting these trainings and things like that, are they being trained to make credibility determinations? Are they being trained in the dynamics of abuse? Are they being trained in delayed disclosure? Things that happen in typical sexual assault decisions so that they can make those judgments. These are very difficult issues, and universities are not necessarily transparent about how well they're educating their people who are making these decisions. All right. Transparency, uh, do you want to challenge what Nicole has just said about transparency? Well, I think our university and our collected rules and regulations, which are reviewed annually, if not more, um, addresses that. And we ha- we do indicate that in our collected rules and regulations as far as how we view the evidence presented. Okay. I've got to take a break. We'll do that now. We're talking about Title IX issues on America's college campuses. And uh, we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Uh, If you'd like to be part of us, give us a call, part of it. Give us a call at 382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Send us an email to talk at stlpublicradio.org or send us a tweet at STL on air. Back in a moment. This is St. Louis on the air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast supported by University College at Washington University with undergraduate and graduate programs part-time evening and online. University College at Washington University offering world-class education within reach. Welcome back as we continue our discussion about misconduct issues on our campuses. Sarah, I'll come back to you with regard to these uh, new regulations that we'll be hearing about in the months ahead. Uh, What what would you like to see in these regulations? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think colleges have, uh, you know, colleges obviously were were felt pressure under the during the Obama administration to take sexual assault and harassment more seriously. But I think many college officials also expressed to me that they felt that the uh, very prescriptive approach of the Obama administration with the uh, enforcement of Title IX was very aggressive. They were investigating, opened a lot of investigations of campuses for potential violations of Title IX and sort of uh, highlighting very specific um, problems with the way that colleges were doing things. I think a lot of uh, officials have been telling me they want more flexibility with respect to handling sexual assault and harassment on their campus. You know, what works for the University of Missouri and St. Louis might not work for a nearby community college, might not work for Mizzou, might not work for Harvard. Um, I think that there is a desire to have more flexibility in terms of um, the best way to approach uh, sexual assault and harassment. So that's one thing that uh, that that folks definitely want to see. Uh, fairness will certainly be a another a key sort of starring element of these new regulations. That is something that Betsy DeVos has been very adamant about about making sure that the process is fair. That has expressed uh, has uh, sparked concerns among some uh, advocates for sexual assault victims that you know, that she is sort of uh, catering to the concerns of accused students and not thinking as much about the people who are victims of traumatic experiences. That remains to be seen, but certainly sort of fairness and and equity and those sorts of things, which I will add, I think most people could get behind those particular concepts. I think that's something that we're, uh, we're going to see more of. Nicole, you were shaking your head during that. I was. Uh, when I hear that universities want more flexibility in being able to um, apply some of the Title IX standards, that scares the heck out of me. Because when you give them flexibility, what you're doing is you're giving them carte blanche to apply it in any way they want. And what we don't want is for a campus student at the Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville who is sexually assaulted to be having an entirely different experience than someone who's sexually assaulted at Washington University. You want a person who is sexually assaulted and reports their rape to know what they're in for, to know what is going to happen, to have some guidance that there are standards here and that they can rest assured that the process will be one that is regulated. 
You're handling just such a case at SIU in Edwardsville right now, aren't you? I am. Right. And the fact that there have not been regulations has been a real problem. In, in what regard? The Basically, the investigation and the uh, decision-making process has been willy-nilly, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word. Um, there hasn't been any explanation to my client of what exactly the process has been, what standards they've used, um, what evidence they've used to make their determinations. Um, it, the process has just been a mess. How long has this been going on? Since October of 2017. Uh-huh. Okay, not not quite a year then. Obviously. Right. Yeah. Back to uh, you, Dana, with regard to this issue of flexibility and what you'd like to see in these regulations. Uh, do you need more flexibility? Um. I'm comfortable with the way things were with the 2011 uh, Dear Colleague letter and guidelines that were that were issued. And I think I do agree that we do need to have some standards and um, some form of agreement across the board between the institutions. I do feel that at the University of Missouri that we have been fair. We give both both parties the opportunity to provide their um, version, information, witnesses. We try very hard not to just accept one story without speaking to the other party. And if we don't hear from one of the parties, we do pursue uh, usually at least three times for each um, party if we don't hear from the other other party involved in the, in the incident. So I understand that Bessie DeVos was concerned there are some institutions out there that um, probably cater more to the victim and that the responding party is not being heard. I do not think that that is fair, but I think we have to look at the situation as a whole to give both parties an opportunity to speak. Who is doing the investigating? Who's doing the investigating? Yeah. At our campus, yeah. a Title IX investigator uh-huh. who has been trained specifically with regard to Title IX. I'd like to go to the phone now because Ron, calling from St. Louis, uh, has, has an issue that fits right in here, I believe. Ron, go ahead. You're on the air. Well, this is very confusing. It sounds like a bunch of lawyers wrote these laws so they can bill at $300 on both sides. That's probably to me, right. <laughs> to me, uh, uh, assault is a police matter and should be handled by state law, and, and the state law should apply across every college and university in that state. So I don't know why you have to have Title IX investigators on a rape charge. They should be turned over to the police department and let them investigate it. They have the proper uh, equipment, hopefully, to, to evaluate this and, and, and uh, take it to a jury trial or, um, or turn it over to a prosecutor. I don't see where you have these investigators uh, they, they're kind of willy-nilly making these type of decisions. I'm I'm really confused as why the, if, there, if somebody was murdered on campus, we wouldn't Ron, turn it over to a title. Don't nine. mean to cut you off, Ron. We have the point. We have limited time, so let's get some reaction. I'm going to start first with Dana from uh, Mizzou, uh, from Umsel. Okay, so our victims have the opportunity. We have our police is our certified University of Missouri. They're they're police officers. They're not security. So they are involved with the investigation. They work with um, forwarding this to the county to address. They can work with us. They don't have to. If they don't want to, we give the victim the opportunity. We also provide the resources so they can speak with um, someone who is an advocate for them. So they have the option. I I don't think it's fair for them just to have one way to go, and that's it. They should have options available to them. Nicole? Yeah, I just want to be very clear um, with the caller, because the caller makes a good point that I think a lot of people get confused, is that there are multiple processes going on here. So there is a criminal system if someone makes a police report, and, and the civil system takes process in terms of a prosecution going on and that can be going on concurrently with this process and then there could also even be a civil process if the person chooses to do a civil lawsuit and that could be going on at the same time too but the university has to take some sort of action if a person reports and there has to be some sort of disciplinary action if there is a student who has committed sexual harassment sexual violence sexual discrimination and that's what title 
Title IX says. So all three of those processes could be going on at the same time. And one of the things that actually that kind of brings us full, full circle that I wanted to say about the UMSL statement that was released recently is that um, when UMSL tells people who they can go forward to and who they can tell and gives a list of people, and they list the Title IX coordinator and they list a number of people, one of the people and groups that I would like to see on that list would be the police. Certainly, I think when a university is telling people who they can come forward to, there should be people on that list who are outside of the institution. Not everyone that you report to should be within the institution, and that's very important because students should have the opportunity to get outside of their institution and see an outside perspective if they want that in order to seek help for themselves. It shouldn't all be within the institution. A yes or no, Dana, on that. Is that seem well go ahead go well ahead. I just want to make comment to that I know on the the document that was issued by the president Monchoy uh, indicates immediately who's there at each specific institution but resources and and websites that we have provide a list of internal resources as well as outside resources that people can go to. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sarah, why is this so confusing? (laughs) I mean, really, I'm having trouble grasping all these (laughs) straws that are flying around. Sure. Well, one reason is that the cases themselves are often incredibly confusing to parse through. So think about your typical environment on a college campus where students are drinking alcohol. They might be using drugs. They Um, are usually at a party, Um, one or both students might be intoxicated, some kind of uh, something happens, whether it's a sexual assault, uh, some kind of unwanted touching, somewhere on the sort of spectrum of sexual misconduct, and one or both students may barely have any recollection of the incident, and there are very few witnesses. So trying to parse out these uh, cases is really, really tough. Uh, but it is important, you know, I know it, it can seem, again, confusing, and it's like, are colleges even prepared to handle these cases? It is important for colleges to have some process to handle these complaints, because, in part because, I mean, they're obviously obligated to under the law, but you also think about court proceedings. They, take, they can take years, and students are on campus for, you know, four or five years, perhaps, They, in a lot of cases, just want to go on with their educational experience, get their degree, and move on with their life. They don't want to go through a lengthy court process, and so they would like to have resources from the university to be able to continue their education, and in some cases, they may, you know, want their, you know, uh, some kind of a no-contact order from their uh, alleged assailant, that kind of thing, but they don't want to go through a whole court process, so uh, again, it's it's confusing, but there is there are good reasons for the, for you know colleges and universities um, handling these cases. Nicole, I gather you're agreeing with what Sarah's saying. Completely agree. Mm-hmm. A university has to be equipped to deal with these things because these are students often or professors on students. There are different types of of issues that come up here, but that have to encounter each other every day in their daily lives, and the universities have to know how to deal with these issues. Yeah. Dana, does Title IX on, on your campus, for instance, does that provide funding for victims or people who are making allegations for bringing in attorneys or advocates of some sort? Well, we do have support. I mean, direct funding um, to victims, I would have to say no, but we do have support in terms of resources and advocates and programs that are available. Are you speaking with regard to if they come in with their attorney or? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of someone who is accusing a classmate of, of impropriety of some sort. When they come in, uh, is it up to them to provide their own attorney and uh, t- uh, take the case that way? Yes, it would be up to them. Um, they can bring a person, um, if it's going to an equity resolution hearing, um, they can bring that person with them to that hearing. Um, but that's not a cost that we're going to incur or that we have talked about at this time. Well, there, Nicole, is another uh, reason why I suspect uh, some students might not come forward. It might be a question of affordability. 
That's true. And a lot of times when I start getting involved is actually when someone comes forward with an accusation mm-hmm. and then it's actually the accused who gets an attorney. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden the accuser thinks, oh my gosh, this is turning into a much bigger thing than I thought it was going to. Now I need an attorney. And that's when I get my phone calls. And so the process does turn into um, somewhat of an uneven situation for accusers mm-hmm. in that situation. And usually that's when I get my phone calls. And Sarah, the, the situation becomes even more problematic when we're not talking about two students. We might be talking about a student and uh, an administrator or a professor. Sure. And we're seeing more of those cases come, come to light now because of the Me Too movement. Um, I mean, universities have to handle those sorts of cases, too. It can get really tricky, especially when you're talking about professors. Many of them have tenure, which is essentially a a guarantee or a a job security for life, uh, unless something really, really uh, uh, something happens. Um, And so that that adds a whole other element to the, the process of dealing with these cases. It can cause them to drag on for a long time. And then, in the, you know, in the meantime, you know, think about a, say, a graduate student who has to work with a particular professor who is her mentor. This professor has harassed her, and she just wants to, again, be able to write her thesis, complete her degree, get out of there, and she doesn't feel that she can do that. But, you know, so colleges are, again, they're in a, they're in a tough spot with dealing with these cases. Another thing I'll mention really quickly that, you know, a lot of this conversation has gotten very... Um, it has gotten legalistic, and I think that's a reflection of how much more legalistic these campus processes have gotten. There are more lawyers involved. The policies are much more sort of prescriptive. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think some people are concerned that the processes, which were originally the purpose of you know, Title IX, for example, is assuring educational opportunity. I think some people feel the move toward a more legalistic process has gotten a little bit away from the sort of educational mission of, of colleges and universities. Um, you know, their, their purpose is to provide uh, and, and maintain educational access for students. When a lot of lawyers get involved, um, it can certainly make things uh, a bit trickier, and that's kind of the status quo that we're seeing on a lot of campuses right now. Dana, what is the process if the complaints involve employees of the university uh, instead of students? As the per- as a complainant? Yeah, complainant uh, and, and perpetrator. Well, we have different processes in place. Uh, the overall process as far as the investigation is the same, but the resolution of that process is followed under a different um, regulations listed in the collective mm-hmm. rules and regulations, as is different with regard to the in- the institution or the university uh, being the respondent and for a faculty member as well. Yeah. So those processes are a little bit different. I'm going to take a quick phone call here. Time is beginning to get away, but I want to bring in Dan, who's calling from Virginia. Go ahead, Dan. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it going to the wire here. Yeah. Um, This may come across as devil's advocate, but I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around the fact that a lot of this seems to be leaning away from a presumption of guilt until proven innocent, as far as the perpetrator goes. She mentioned it just now briefly, which is the first I've heard of it in this entire discussion. We're having resolutions made against people who have not been proven guilty. And I don't know how to wrap my brain around that, especially with this whole Me Too movement, sexual assault movement going on. I understand the victim side of it. Don't get me wrong. But when you come to rule of law, I come up at a loss. Decisions are being made, and nobody has been proven guilty. Okay, Dan, we have the point. Uh, Nicole, do you want to respond to that? Sure. I think uh, what we're talking about here is whether there's going to be a disciplinary proceeding proceeding on a university campus. And so that's exactly what we're talking about, is what standard is going to be applied to judging these cases in terms of applying discipline on a university campus and what accommodations are going to be provided to students who have these things happen to them. And so um, it, it is obviously an innocent until proven guilty standard. I think that's going to be a given across the board. But then it's what evidence do we need to build a case to find somebody guilty in order to apply some sort of discipline at a university that 
gets federal funding. Right. Uh, Sarah, one last question for you. And again, time is really becoming a, our, our enemy here. What, in terms of cost, what is this costing colleges and universities? It's expensive. Um, I, you know, uh, colleges now have to have a full-time Title IX coordinator, or not full-time Title IX coordinator, but they do have to designate a Title IX coordinator. A lot of peop- a lot of colleges have chosen to hire someone full-time. Um, many colleges have also decided to hire full-time investigators, full-time people to do training and education for students, faculty, and staff on campuses. These offices can, um, at some institutions there, it's dozens of staffers. Um, that obviously is not the case for every university. People are, you know, colleges have different resources. Um, but it's, it's certainly not cheap to, uh, to do this. You know, I think most colleges would say it's very important to address sexual assault and harassment. It's, it's critical. But it's, it's certainly fair to say that some colleges are, are cash strapped and they are concerned about being able to, um, to fund these offices at the level that they feel that they need to to address these issues. And so we'll have to see how that continues to shake out. And there, of course, can be millions of dollars uh, being thrown around in terms of liability for some of these uh, issues. Correct, Nicole? Sure, but it concerns me when we talk about the cost of this, because if you were talking about the cost of murders or assaults or any other kind of crime on campus, I don't think it would be as big of an issue. We have to address this. It's crime on campus. Didn't the Nasser case cost uh, tens and maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in liability? Sure, and that's what happens when people don't take responsibility for what's going on on their campus. I'm going to have to leave it there. I'm afraid time is up for us. I want to thank uh, Dana Petit-Daniels of the University of Missouri-St. Louis for being with us. Thank you. Nicole Gorowski, a local attorney, thank you. And we want to thank Sarah Brown, senior reporter with the Chronicle of Higher Education in Washington. Thank you all so much. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.